Welcome to the IIE Awards Online 2020 program. We're so pleased to welcome you to the latest event in our series of online webinars designed to inspire, influence, and share environmental best practice. Today's event will be focused on the challenge of climate change and nature loss, thinking global and acting local for biodiversity and green spaces. Throughout the webinar, you can ask questions by the Q&A tab, and then they'll be answered later in the event. Recordings of all events throughout the week will be shared by e-newsletter e to all attendees after Friday. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the IA Awards, and we've decided to launch a full program of free online events for you and your team to join. The aim is to engage organizations with different environmental initiatives to inspire, influence, and share best practice. The program will culminate in the IA Awards tomorrow at 4 p.m. on International Clean Air Day, which is Thursday, the 8th of October. This has been a very unsettling year for everyone with this global COVID-19 pandem pandemic affecting businesses, communities, and individuals. The health and sustainability of our environment has never been so critical. The climate crisis and loss of biodiversity has further been exacerbated by the economic, health, and social challenges created by COVID-19. The pandemic has markedly changed business practices for the long term, and perhaps there are opportunities to embed new ways of working to make businesses more sustainable. We believe changing working practices to incorporate environmental decisions into the very heart of our organizations is vital to build resilience and create strong, sustainable businesses. So by running our events online, we're hoping to bring people together, share learnings, and also be an example of how events can be run sustainably in the future too. If you'd like to attend any other events this week, there's still time to register your place. This, uh, today, there's one starting at four o'clock this afternoon, and our final event, the IA Awards, begins tomorrow at four o'clock, again on 8th October. I'd like to introduce you to our two fantastic speakers today, Dr. Pete Brotherton, Director of Science and Climate Change at Natural England, which is the government's official advisor on nature conservation in England. His talk will present the latest evidence of how our climate and the natural world are changing, taking a global and UK view. It will also consider why these changes matter and how we might respond, taking into account new environmental policies and opportunities. Peter will be joined by speaker Dr. Sean McCormick, who is incredibly passionate about community and nature. Growing up in Ireland, Sean spent his childhood obsessed by birds, bugs, and plants and is a self-confessed nature nerd. Dreaming of being a vet, Sean completed a degree in animal science, followed by a veterinary medicine degree in Dublin. Sean now lives in Ealing, where he combines his passion and extensive knowledge of the natural world to lead Ealing Wildlife Group, guiding through education and conservation. He's got a podcast, Sean's Wildlife, where he talks candidly with guests about biodiversity, conservation, and our human connection with nature. We will be announcing the winner of IE's special award category, Natural Environment Champion, towards the end of the event. Thank you very much to Davies Veterinary Specialist for supporting this category and making this event possible today. With that, I hand it over to you, Pete. Good morning. Can I, can I just check that you can hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, so good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here as a director from Natural England. I'm also a trustee of that fantastic charity that is um, the Peterborough Environment City Trust Pact. So it's a, it's a double privilege to be and a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, as um, April has said, I'm going to um, canter through some of the latest evidence around climate change and biodiversity loss, um, but very much want to be um, talking about solutions and pointing to the future in terms of some of the developing policy um, initiatives that we're seeing at international and national level. So. 2020, um, this time last year, we were talking about 2020 as a super year for the environment. Many of us hoped that this would be the year where leaders of the world would come together at two critical UN conferences under the Convention of Biological Diversity in, um, in China. That would have been starting about now. And um, later in the year in, in Glasgow, um, at COP26, the UN um, meeting on climate change. And we hoped that this would be the year that leaders would finally confront these two joined crises and come up with meaningful commitments to address um, what's really the, the, the biggest challenge facing humankind. 
course, 2020 has certainly been momentous, but for very different reasons. And though both of those events are now postponed until next year. However, the evidence base that was, un, that was being gathered uh, to support those events has continued to be, um, to be gathered and, and analyzed. And we've seen over the last um, several months, some of that evidence appearing. So 10 years ago, um, in the province of Aichi in Japan, there was a, sorry, I'm just trying to move this forward. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna drop back now. Um, there, there was uh, a, an important strategic plan agreed for the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, and 20 targets set um, to be met by 2020 to finally try to tackle the challenge of biodiversity loss. The report for that, Global Biodiversity Outlook 5, came out last month and sadly not one of those 20 targets have been met at global level. Each country had to report their own contribution and the UK government's own assessment was that the UK missed 75% of those targets. Prominent amongst those misses was, was uh, the target to stop the decline of species. We now know that over 1 million species are threatened with extinction around the world and those are the ones that we know about and can name. Many others are likely to be um, highly vulnerable. The WWF and the Zoological Society of London produce a living planet index, uh, which looks at the change of abundance across a whole range of species. And the index for vertebrates, these are the boned species, so fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals, has declined by 68% um, since 1970 around the world. Here in the UK, sorry, I'm Clicking forward too far. Here in the UK, um, we've seen uh, species losses going back right since the turn of um, the 20th century, particularly um, since the Second World War. We, we know of 500 species that we can name that have been lost completely from England, and another 1,400 that, that are threatened using international criteria. 40% of all species in the UK are in decline, including many um, that we, we would have once treated as really common and familiar, hedgehogs, sparrows, the common cuckoo, the common scoter, the common frog, the common toad. In fact, it's quite a good rule of thumb that if, it, if we know of a species as common, it's probably no longer common and is often on our um, protected species lists. 25% of all UK mammals are now threatened with, ex with extinction. And, and those losses play out at local levels too. So, one vascular plant, a flowering plant, is lost per English county every two years. Of course, the driver of those changes are the UK habitat losses. And, and we started early, it has to be said, due to um, our, lead, our lead role in the Industrial Revolution. And we've seen large historic um, declines um, in a range of habitats. Um, so the fens, our heathlands, um, meadows, ponds and hedgerows have all been um, severely lost um, over um, the, the last hundred or so years, and leaving us as one of the most UK, as one of the most nature depleted nations on earth. Of course, the driver of that loss is is our consumption of nature primarily um, for a range of things, development and um, and mining and other industries, but in particular um, to feed us. And here's a couple um, statistics that appeared from a paper um, just over a year ago now that I, I still think is, I always find astonishing. I still think it, it makes me, you know, sit up and, and really challenge the way we're engaging with the world. So if we weigh, if we take the weight, the biomass of, of all humans on earth, we now out outweigh all wild mammals. That's everything from whales through to elephants and rats and bats. Um, nearly 10 times over. And our livestock outweigh us by nearly twice as much. So overall, um, wild mammals now account for less than 5% of all the mammal biomass that there is in the world. If we look at chickens, the biomass of domestic chickens that are alive at any time um, outweighs um, all wild birds. If you think of the huge colonies of 
um, seabirds, penguins, and so on, um, those are all outweighed when you add them up over three times just by the chickens that we keep alive to feed us. Over 50 billion chickens are alive at any time for our use. And that, that consumption of nature, that capturing of the Earth's resources is, is really um, at the heart of the challenge that we face and that nature faces, because these losses aren't just sad, those losses represent a, um, a loss of the um, resilience of the ecosystems and the environment upon which we ultimately depend. It's as if we're playing Jenga, if you like, with, with the natural world, where we pull out the different bits and, um, and make the systems that, that support us more and more vulnerable to collapse. Of course, um, a lot of that change is leading to emissions in carbon dioxide. Um, this is the um, readout of actual measurements that uh, are made in um, Hawaii. This is the longest record of, of measured carbon dioxide change. But we can go back further than this. Um, this is scary enough. But if we go back further, we can look at the isotopes of carbon um, in ice cores, which give us a, an accurate um, estimate of the, of the um, carbon dioxide concentrations. Um, um, when, the, um, when the ice was deposited um, in places like Antarctic. And that those records allow us to look back 800,000 years in time. And uh, if, we, if we look to the left of the graph first, we see it fluctuates. There are fluctuations often associated with, um, with ice ages in the past. But this line on the right here isn't the edge of the graph. This is where we are now. Humans have been around for this period, for about the last 300,000 years. So what we're living through now is something that um, humankind have, has never experienced. Those, um, that carbon is a very good warming gas, um, and, and is, is carbon dioxide a very good warming gas, and that's leading to, um, to warming of the Earth, as, um, as we all know on this call, don't we? And, um, and at the moment, we're about one degree um, possibly a bit over one degree um, from uh, above pre-industrial um, temperatures and well on track to three or four degrees. That one degree um, doesn't sound too bad, but I think, it, you know, you, you think, well, one degree, why is that making such a difference to the Earth already? Well, it's partly because whenever we see these figures of, of one degree, we need to keep reminding ourselves that this is an average global figure. Most of the Earth is sea. So, um, and sea doesn't warm as much as land. So, um, so that one degree equates to very different experiences across different parts of the earth. And four degrees or three degrees will, be, um, will make much of our land area completely impossible to live in. Um, we're already seeing um, significant changes. Here's some headlines just from this year, record temperatures in, in the Antarctic record um, warmth uh, over winter in, in Europe. And we've all seen the, um, the heat in the Northern Hemisphere um, this, this summer with the Arctic burning um, and the permafrost beginning to thaw, terrible fires in California, um, um, awful fires, probably some of them um, um, man-made in, in the Amazon, but not just the Amazon rainforest now burning, also the Pantanal wetlands in the Amazon. And, um, and as models have been predicting for the last 50 years, a, a, key, diff a key change associated with these um, weather um, patterns is, um, is an increasing frequency of extreme events. And these extreme events are, of course, um, affecting poor countries far more than the rich countries. So the countries that are, um, have done the least to cause uh, climate change are often the most affected. So what do we do? Um, well, I, I mean, it all sounds pretty, aw it is awful, and it sounds awful. Um, and, you know, th this is a, th we should not underestimate the challenge that this presents us um, as, a, as a species. But the, the good news is we know how to fix this. This is all um, something that, um, that is, is within our grasp to put right. In this, in this chart, I've put up, some of those solutions. On the top left are the ones that, in, in an orangey red, um, are ones that are particularly important for tackling climate change, such as switching to renew, 
of renewable energy sources, reducing the, um, the F gases, the, the fluorinated gases that are still being released. We all remember banning um, chlorofluorocarbons, but there are a number of other fluorinated gases that are still released and are extremely important in causing climate change, and in particular, energy efficiency and carbon capture. On the bottom right um, are, are measures that are particularly important for tackling biodiversity loss. But in the middle, in, in blue, um, are, are measures that deal with both of those. These, this is very much a joint crisis that, um, that, are, that many people talk of as two sides of the same coin. And many of the measures that we need to, um, to tackle climate change, notably around large scale habitat protection, and in particular sustainable agriculture and consuming less meat and dairy, um, are, are measures that benefit both biodiversity and, um, and climate. And in, and in the bottom here, I've circled um, an area that a, a lot of people are attaching a, um, a lot of significance to, so-called nature-based solutions, where um, restoring nature will not just be good for, for biodiversity, but for um, tackling climate change, such as by planting forests or restoring peat, um, but also helping us to adapt to the inevitable change that is coming, because the next 40 years of um, climate change are largely locked in. So we need to adapt to that change we know there will, be, um, the, there will be more flooding, we know there will be greater droughts uh, and so on. Um, and nature holds solutions to those societal problems. So there are real win-wins in that nature-based solution space. And it's affordable. And I think this is something that if ever COVID has taught us, this is it. Um, estimates of the cost of COVID um, around the world are running up to, up to $80 trillion. Um, all estimates that I've seen for um, reversing biodiversity loss and halting climate change run at less than that. So, um, so we're in the same ballpark as we will spend this year as a, as a, as a global community um, in terms of dealing with the COVID crisis. And there is a massive opportunity now to restart a different path for humanity after the COVID crisis. We can either go back to the industries that we had before um, and then fix this at some time in the future when there's less of nature to help us, there's less of nature to save and the climate change crisis is harder to tackle, or we start now. And, and I'm sure many of us on this call would want the time to be now. The, and th there's reasons to be hopeful in terms of the policy responses. So uh, um, three years ago now, the UK published its 25 year plan to improve the environment. This is a good plan. Um, um, implementation still needs to be seen through, but the ambition in that plan is positive. Last year, we became the first um, country to um, embed uh, a, net zero uh, a net zero target in law. So by 2050, we will be at net zero by law. We see measures, particularly the 640 million um, Nature for Climate Fund, um, which will target significant planting of trees. This will change the way England looks. Over 10,000 hectares of trees will, will be planted year on year for the next 25 years um, if, we're, if we're to um, deliver what we think tree planting need, needs to deliver for net zero. And this 640 million will get that started, as well as playing a significant role in restoring our peatlands. And, and that is also critical. There's more carbon locked up in our peat by far than, um, than in our forests. And in fact, there's more carbon in our peat than in the forests of France and Germany combined. We're, we're hoping for a, a really effective Environment Act um, that should return to Parliament in the next month or so. Um, with binding environmental targets, and that should be supported by a strong um, um, agricultural act that shifts payment to farmers um, much more into a space of paying them for delivering public benefits, and uh, a fisheries act um, that will help to achieve sustainable fisheries. And on the international phase, stage as well, we've just seen at the UN meeting um, a, a leader's pledge for nature where nearly 70 countries have signed up to reverse biodiversity loss by 30, 30, 2030. 
and, and have committed to a 30 by 30 target, whereby 30% of our land will be protected um, for biodiversity by 2030. And the UK signed that as well. In December this year, um, it'll be the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Um, and all countries, all signatories of that accord will need to update their carbon commitments. And we can hope for ambitious commitments there. And looking ahead to next year, the UK will have the presidency of both the G7 and climate change COPs. Um, and that's a fantastic opportunity for the UK to really show global leadership on that international um, um, stage. And I hope, I'm sure many of us hope, that the UK will lead from the front and, um, and take many steps itself towards addressing these joint challenges. So finally, I, I want to say thank you. I, that, going back to that slide where I put up the solutions, a lot of those solutions need businesses to come with us on this journey. And, um, and businesses talk, telling politicians that this is a journey that they want for the country and that they need to see us, that they, that they want the country to go on this way is incredibly important. And, um, and I'm really grateful to all those businesses that are joining today who are leading that sustainability um, challenge, um, that sustainability charge. You're, you're incredibly important to, um, to us, um, you know, putting the earth on a much um, safer journey. So thank you for listening and, um, and thank you for all you do. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Pete. That's um, really excellent background knowledge and information for people to understand, uh, you know, why we're, why we're doing all of this, uh, especially within the context of the global, global climate crisis. Um, and how that's affecting biodiversity. So we're gonna hear now from Dr. Sean McCormack uh, about how to engage really with uh, biodiversity, how to connect with nature yourselves and how you might be able to join up with local wildlife groups, um, as well as some other sort of uh, enlightening and motivational um, bits of information about supporting biodiversity in your area. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, April, and thank you uh, for inviting me on. It's a real privilege to speak um, at this event. I'm very inspiring and great to follow um, Pete's talk as well. Can you all see my screen now, yeah? Okay. Yep, I so, can see you. <laughs> great, brilliant. So as April said at the start, I am a vet by profession, but um, I think if I rewind the clock a little bit, uh, maybe I chose the wrong path. I was definitely a, a absolutely nature-mad little boy and um, quite stubbornly, you know, decided on the veterinary path as that was the only animal type career that I knew as a child. And I was told it'd be very difficult to become a vet. So that made me all the more determined. But I did my usual six years in clinical practice and um, got a little bit bored and jaded of just dealing with domestic pets all the time and, and realized that my true passion was in wildlife and nature conservation. So in uh, 2016, I came out of clinical practice, went into an industry role, which gave me a little bit more free time. And that's when I set up a local uh, wildlife conservation group, almost by accident. Um, I'll tell you about that in a second, um, called Ealing Wildlife Group. And I'm just going to share with you some of the things that we're doing, because one of my favorite phrases in conservation and in dealing with the climate crisis that we're all no doubt overwhelmed by at times and very anxious about at times, eco-anxiety is a real thing. Um, one of my favorite phrases is this thinking global, acting local. And that's exactly what Ealing Wildlife, has, Ealing Wildlife Group has become. It's become very much a grassroots conservation organization. And where it all began was um, a friend of mine tagged me on a Facebook post where a journalist was asking about bats in a local viaduct in Hanwell, where I live in West London. And I knew nothing about the bats in the viaduct, but I did know about bats. Um, I was a, a bit of a, a nature geek, as I say. And um, to people's astonishment, um, my knowledge on bats was a little bit off the scale for normal people. And they asked, would I put on a bat walk or a talk? Um, and I decided, well, that would be a good idea to engage local people with nature. It would be very interesting to see if there are um, bats roosting in this viaduct. Um, so I put out a request on a local neighborhood Facebook group and said, if I bought, borrowed, or uh, begged for a bat detector of somebody, would people be interested in coming on a bat walk uh, this summer? And over 400 people in my local area said yes. So there was obviously an appetite for people to engage with nature and are 
green spaces and, and find out more about it. So that's where Ealing Wildlife Group was born. Um, we became a Facebook group just to organize some bat walks and it grew into a very large community of people who are interested in our green spaces, getting outdoors, nature, learning about our local wildlife. And it's uh, exceeded all my expectations. We're now at over 3,400 members. Um, in normal times, non-COVID times, bat walks remain a staple kind of activity of what we do right from spring up to around this time of year when bats are starting to uh, go into hibernation. And um, this is an example on, on screen of, of the type of groups we attract. We've had uh, our record was over 90 people on a bat walk. I felt like the Pied Piper of, of Ealing leading them through uh, the dark in, in our local parks. Um, but bats are a very good indicator species for the health of our ecosystems and our habitats. The more, biodiver the more diversity of bat species and the more number of bats you have in a habitat, the more you can say uh, that ha that habitat is quite valuable and then protect it. So we've sort of used bats as an emblem of our group and we um, also do lots of other activities and we've moved from just being a Facebook discussion forum where people share their sightings of wildlife into being a practical hands-on conservation group as well. So what I wanna do first is just share with you a few examples of thinking global, acting local in your community and hopefully that might inspire um, some of you to start something or get involved with something similar in your area. Um, and then I want to give my five top tips for um, kind of being more sustainable as an individual and as an organization. Um, just some ideas. It's really a, a, a very broad list, but might hopefully um, pique your interest or inspire you to do something uh, good in your area. So a few projects that we run, um, this is our annual project, which we're in the thick of at the moment. I was up very late last night, um, kind of uh, proofing board, design boards for this. It's our annual wildlife photography exhibition. And we run a competition and ask people to submit their nature or wildlife photos um, from the borough of Ealing within the last five years, really to do a couple of things. One is to showcase our natural and wild spaces in Ealing, zone three in London. We are very, very lucky to have an amazing network of parks and green spaces here. And it's absolutely incredible what kind of biodiversity has shown up um, through people sending in their sightings on Ealing Wildlife Group. But secondly, and I think this is more important for me, is that we're celebrating the relationships that people have with nature and what it does for them. And this year we've seen that play such an important role in people's lives. And we're having a lot of feedback saying, you know, without my daily walks in nature, my mental health would have suffered so much more. Um, you know, people who can't get out, maybe finding, you know, the postings on, on this Facebook group, really inspiring and lifting their spirits in times where they can't access that nature themselves. So there is power in connecting with nature. And that's what we're trying to do by, um, by putting on this annual exhibition. And it's in beautiful setting of Walpole Park in, um, in Ealing. It's about a five minute walk from Ealing Broadway Station. Um, amazingly, there are little owls breeding in this public park in, in Zone 3 in London. Um, so if you want to come on down, we're opening on October 16th. Little plug there for, uh, for our exhibition. Another thing that we did very early on in our days when we were very much bat focused is we got a community environmental grant from Greg's the Bakers, funnily enough. People are always you know, a little surprised uh, that Greg's the Bakers has an environmental community grant, but actually there is a lot of money out there and grant money out there for people to get up in their own community and do things for themselves and, and put, put kind of uh, this conservation into practice um, in your local community. So we got uh, 2000 pounds from Greg's, we equipped ourselves with a load of bat detectors so we could bring people out and engage them with bats and habitats. And we also got a very fancy bat detector so that we could GPS map all of our bat records. Because what I found out subsequently was that Ealing was one of the most under-recorded boroughs in London for bats. So we submit all of our bat records to the Bat Conservation Trust and to uh, Green Space Information for Greater London. Um, and what we did with the, the other uh, part of money was we um, restored a habitat, a fairly derelict kind of meadow environment that had been encroached on by trees and the water source in there had been shaded out. And we started to do some habitat management for bats, which also benefits a lot of other biodiversity. And we've had some amazing creatures show up, quite rare uh, things. We do a bio blitz every year in July, um, not this year, unfortunately, where we invite the community down to discover what's at Bull's Meadow. And we give them a recording sheet and the, the idea is to record as many species of fungi, plants and animals that you can in a single day. And it's quite fun. It's a really great way to engage the environment, engage the community. But we also involve the community. So we have um, volunteer days where we're putting in 
habitat features like this stag beetle stumpery. We're putting up bat and bird boxes and we're teaching people about nature as we go. Uh, last year, we were very lucky to get funding from the National Park City Festival, um, Mayor of London funding, and we put on a series of events which were all about education, but expanding our reach out of kind of central Ealing, where we did a lot of our um, bat walks and, and normal kind of park activities into areas of the borough that we hadn't really done a lot of outreach in before and areas of the borough where residents maybe don't engage or use their green spaces as much. So we wanted to engage all ages and all kind of diversities across um, our community. So we put on a series of events called Ealing Wild Discovery Days and uh, we put on bat walks, bug hunts, pond dipping. Um, we gave people tours of our owl box project, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, we showed people our um, habitats that we work on for great crested newt conservation, and just gave them a, a good kind of broad overview of, of what we have on our doorstep and how they can come in and get involved in protecting it as well. Um, our ongoing project that we're currently doing and it's kind of wrapping up its first season is an owl conservation project and we chose owls for two reasons. It's a joint project with ourselves and the council park ranger team. Um, one is that owls are a very endearing species and uh, we went into the Tesco bags of help scheme where if you buy a plastic bag um, you get a token and you can donate it to a charity or a, an organization or a cause in your local area and owls are very endearing and they you know people people love owls so we thought they were a good um, kind of emblem of what we were doing but they're an apex predator species so anything like bats being an, an indicator species owls being a predator a top of the food chain predator anything that we do for owl conservation will actually benefit all the lower levels of the food chain as well right down to you know your micro invertebrates in, in grassland and woodland and things like that so we put up um, 18 owl boxes our main target species was the barn owl which we had seen hunting um, in Ealing in several of our, our green spaces but we had yet to find um, any record of them breeding and um, we wanted to bring them in. Uh, we also put up tawny and little owl boxes around the borough. Um, and a member, a volunteer um, from our group decided he would do a, um, a documentary for us on this project. So episode one is on our YouTube channel. Um, you can go and have a look at that. And we, we decided that, that was an important part because again, video content and social media is a big, big part of what we do to pique people's interest, to engage them, to show them what's going on in their community and to say, come on board, we've got volunteer opportunities, we've got these uh, incredible species on our doorstep and we'd like to tell you about them. And it's been really, really successful. As I say, we've grown from zero to 3,500 nearly in um, the space of four years. Um, and not only were we putting up uh, kind of the nest boxes, which is one small and visible part of this scheme, but there's no point providing breeding sites for owls if they can't feed. So we have worked closely with the local council and their parks team grassland management um, kind of program to change wide scale habitats into habitats that owls will find food in. So, for example, we've pushed back some scrub and we've um, let kind of field margins in large areas grow into rough grassland habitat whereas previously they've been managed entirely for wildflower meadow, which is quite a um, you know, high emissions carbon approach. Um, it involves annual mowing of the, um, of the sward and taking all the cuttings off the grass. So we're basically trying to create a mosaic of habitats and create rough grassland habitat that is never mown. It's just topped every three or four years to stop kind of scrub and trees growing into it. Um, and that will actually promote better root systems, better soil ecology, um, but fundamentally for the owls, it encourages their main prey source, the field vole, to move in and inhabit the thick kind of thatch of dead grass that forms in the base layer of that, of that habitat. So we're doing that across um, acres and acres of green space in Ealing, and hopefully um, we'll have success. And I can share with you, because it's the end of the breeding season now, that we have had a pair of barn owls in one of our six barn owl boxes, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, as I said, the, the National Park City Festival, I've gone backwards. The last and newest project we're doing, we do a lot, but I'm just giving you a highlight. The newest project that we are working on at the moment 
and we've just reached our funding and started working on is um, transforming a derelict allotment space which flooded um, for, for much of the year, um, definitely all winter and into spring. Um, very unsuitable for growing vegetables, but we decided to be a fantastic resource to protect for wildlife. And we raised 20,000 pounds through crowdfunding and match funding from Ealing Council and this initiative called Space Hive um, to basically transform this derelict allotment site, it's four and a half thousand square meters into a space for nature and protect it from development in future. And that is a real community uh, project, you know, the community funded it. Um, we had a local developer um, give us a large donation, you know, to offset um, some of the criticism they get for development in the area. And we are creating an educational hub there with a transformed um, renovated storage container, a wildlife garden and the rest of it will be transformed into nature reserve with pond and bird hide and things like that. But it's very much a community led initiative and we are being COVID safe and working volunteering in kind of socially distant groups of six on that as we speak. Um, so have a look at that on our website. Um, you, can, you can see what we're up to there. So moving on um, to what you can do as a business or as an individual in your home life, in your work life. Um, I just want to give five kind of areas that you can think about if you want to be more sustainable, if you want to boost biodiversity, you know, on your doorstep or in the wider kind of local area, um, and what you can maybe do to protect green spaces, because especially in urban environments, we're losing them all the time. Um, and as Peter said, you know, the value of those habitats is being degraded all the time with um, development and pollution and, and fragmentation of habitats as well. So it's really important that we protect those. So first of all, I'm obviously going to say that uh, I would highly recommend you join a local uh, conservation group. Um, we didn't really have one uh, in Ealing that was dedicated solely to wildlife and kind of animal biodiversity, which is my passion uh, area. Um, so I set one up myself um, and I said, as I said, it was quite by accident, but it, it kind of uh, rolled into something much bigger than I ever thought it would. Um, and it's become a really, really important part of my life that gives me a lot of energy and um, a lot of positivity as well. Um, what you can do, you know, if, if you do have one of those in your local area, um, if, if not, do think of setting one up, talk to like-minded people, put a shout out on local social media groups. Would anyone be interested in doing something like this? But if you do have one, get out volunteering with them. Um, we have a lot of, we have a core group out of 3,000, three and a half thousand people. We probably have a core group of about 100, 150 people who are really, really active with us. And of those, probably about a pool of 50 people who do come to volunteer events. So we could get a lot more done if people put their hand up and said, I can help. I can help one Saturday a month or I can help with some admin, you know, one evening a week. Um, so do get out volunteering. If you are thinking about your kind of a corporate social responsibility program at work, um, team away days, you know, volunteering on a local project like we're doing at at the allotments in Costons Lane um, would be a great way to get people involved, team building, um, you know, local groups are looking for that people power to get things done. So have a think about that. It's also a very social thing. So it's a great way to meet new people. It's a great way to um, alleviate some of that eco anxiety that we're all feeling by talking to like minded people. And I don't, I'm not from Ealing, as you can probably tell from my accent, but I'm a big believer in building a village wherever you live and connecting with local groups and communities and networks and starting to get to know people in your area. And it's a really great way to do that. There's awesome power and positivity of people working together towards a common goal. And also, another benefit is um, you can learn a lot about nature. We have experts on everything from slides molds to birds to beetles um, and uh, the level of expertise in the group is absolutely phenomenal. The second thing I would encourage you to do and this is especially as businesses and organizations is to sponsor local green initiatives so we would not have got £20,000 in funding for um, transforming this space um, into a nature reserve unless it was for businesses saying do you know what these people are doing good and we want to get behind that. Um, and I think, um, you know, you can you can look for those initiatives in your local area. There's lots of people doing good if you if you try and find them. And if you have the kind of funding to support some of those initiatives, every little does help. Um, and it would be great if you don't have the funding. I would always say there's other ways that you can help. You can donate supplies. You can donate your services, your practical support um, on the ground. You can also get involved with these organizations 
in other ways like offering kind of business consultancy or advisory um, services. Legal advice um, is something that we um, really need. We are a group of you know four volunteers on our committee there um, and we all have full-time jobs and personal lives and we try and do as much as we can and sometimes people say you, you should be doing this and you should be doing more and it's like we only have limited time and, and resource to do what we do. So having professionals come on board or offer their services to us for free would be really, really helpful. So have a think about that, having a th have a think about getting on a board, getting on a committee and, and um, helping out in other ways than just being hands-on on the ground volunteering, if you can't. We had a wonderful um, plant sale fundraiser, wildlife gardening plant sale, where lots of our members grew plants from seed for the group and we raised over 800 pounds for the group. Um, by just our community getting involved. Fantastic social um, event as well. Third point is, uh, you know, encouraging you to boost biodiversity at home and at work. And that can really be from tiny little things. Like if you have, uh, you know, you don't have a garden, you don't even have a balcony, you might have a window ledge that you could put a planter on, a window box on, and sow some wildflowers in there for pollinators. That's a tiny little thing that you can do for biodiversity. Um, it's also a talking point, you know, um, talking about li these little interventions is really important and sharing it. If you have window spaces at work, why don't, why don't you nominate yourself to do something next spring for wildlife and window boxes and get people at work talking about what everyone can do in their own little space. Um, starting simple often piques interest with people who maybe haven't had an interest before. Um, you can do something like, you know, a stick on bird feeder on your window or a whole bird feeding station in your garden, or you can go large scale if you're a large organization and, um, you know, thinking about uh, new facilities or new buildings, putting in a green roof. This is a, a photo from a friend of mine who manages um, bees, beehives on um, buildings in central London on the roof spaces. And uh, he was very surprised to find a very rare orchid popping up on a green roof um, in central London. Um, and also black red start, which is a, a very um, kind of rare and threatened bird of urban spaces and what we would call uh, waste ground or brownfield sites um, popping up on a, a, a roof space in the city. So it's amazing when, where nature pops up giving, given the opportunity. Um, I talk about food a lot. I have an allotment. Um, I think, you know, you can also boost biodiversity and you can reconnect with where your food comes from, which is a big part of the, the climate uh, picture um, if you grow organic food and, um, you know, reduce your food miles and things like that. So maybe if it's not about biodiversity, it's about growing food closer to home um, and putting in things like bug hotels, log piles um, and wildlife gardening. You'll be astonished at the things that show up. As Peter said, a lot of our common species, our common garden species, hedgehogs, frogs, toads, stag beetles and things like that are very, very uh, vulnerable at the moment and need our help. Uh, the fourth tip is uh, to think about if you want to take on a project or contribute to something is transforming a local space. So there are lots of little patches of public and private land. Um, there's a lot of council land that maybe you could influence the management of in a better way for the climate, in a better way for biodiversity. So this is a, a central median in Ealing, the Ealing Hospital, where the council in Ealing are very proactive in um, kind of biodiversity initiatives. And um, they've stepped off their lawn mowing regime, which is absolutely fantastic. They get some complaints about things being scruffy, but I think no one would argue that that's a much more beautiful um, display of um, sown wildflowers, not all of them native, um, but some of them native, um, but leaving that lawn grass and wildflowers to flowers much better than having a monoculture mown lawn and also much better for the environment. So my, my advice would be if you are a garden owner, step off the lawnmower and lose the, uh, the obsession with tidiness um, that we have um, of everything being neat edges and, and tidied up leaves and things like that. Tidy gardens are over and I'd encourage if you want to look into that, there's a fantastic initiative by um, a friend of mine um, called Mary Reynolds called We Are The Ark, which is about letting some space, spaces recover and go back and just be spaces for wildlife and nature to, to be themselves. Um, so have a look at that. Um, if you have a little strip outside your business, outside your home of mown grass, why don't you think about taking up that turf and planting uh, native wildflowers on it for next season? A really fantastic thing to do and gets people talking. And then finally, I know we're running short on time. Um, I think the biggest thing is what Peter talked about on kind of uh, nature recovery networks and, and um, green recovery. 
and nature-based solutions is this is larger scale um, initiatives and um, rewilding is a, a very much a, a buzzword or a kind of a, a growing term now in popularity um, and can describe a lot of things. It's often misunderstood as a term. Um, it can be a contentious topic for some landowners and um, managers and things. Um, it's not the kind of uh, fantastical idea of bringing back wolves and bears into Britain all the time. It can just be about taking large expanses of land and allowing nature to regenerate itself and stepping off that obsession of management and traditional conservation, which has a great place in, in um, biodiversity protection, but isn't working entirely because we're still seeing all those declines. But what we're seeing with rewilding large kind of tracts of land is that nature is recovering itself and some surprising um, species are turning up again and turning up in numbers. The other benefit of allowing nature to recover and in micro kind of scale, we talk about it with our rough grassland management in Ealing, is that um, allowing kind of natural plant ecosystems to establish and the soil to recover from human kind of intervention and management um, does sequester a lot of carbon into the, into the soil. That is a fantastic way of, um, of helping um, with climate change and, and carbon emissions. Um, you get a natural ecosystem recovery and farming and agriculture can be part of that. You can have sustainable or regenerative agriculture principles alongside rewilding and allowing um, nature to come back. And um, to, on Peter's point about tree planting, actually what rewilding does is it takes away the need to do expensive and um, kind of uh, high time, high effort um, projects on actually putting trees in the ground which releases some carbon with rewilding trees will regenerate themselves and there's some fantastic organizations Heal Rewilding is a new charity that's aiming very very simple aims to raise money buy land and rewild it um, have a look at those um, Rewilding Britain are kind of advocating a lot of uh, this approach and hoping that it gets into the government strategy in terms of the, the kind of 25 year targets Peter talked about and I'll just take this opportunity, if I can, to talk about um, a future venture of mine, which I'm in the planning stages of now with a business partner, which is AgriWild. And we are um, hoping to rewild land, enhance biodiversity and fight climate change. Um, so we just launched our website. You can have a look on there. And if you're interested, do get in touch. But basically what we're planning to do is what Peter talked about, buying land and um, rewilding it alongside kind of reconnecting people with that. And people are asking us, how much land do you want to buy? I will be very honest and say the sky's the limit. We are looking at fundraising opportunities at the moment for buying as large a tract or tracts of land um, as we can to try and um, kind of offset some of the, the issues that we're facing. So there's more information um, on our website um, and please, please do get in touch if you're interested in what we're doing, if you have any services to offer um, and you would like to kind of get involved. We need people's help, we can't do it alone um, and we're aiming high, so do have a look at that. If you want to um, follow what we're doing on Ealing Wildlife Group, have a look at our website, um, sign up to our newsletter and follow us on um, all of our social media channels um, or drop us a line on hello at Ealing Wildlife Group as well. So that's it from me. Amazing, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, that's so inspiring. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a really fantastic local wildlife group and I, I need to get more involved. Uh, that's really where I got my, my start. My passion was doing citizen science. And I think that's so important with um, giving ownership uh, to local people of, of their um, natural resources really that are local to them. So some really interesting points as well made about uh, you know the importance of that interconnectedness of species and how conserving one helps to conserve many. Also about grant funding, a few questions for you around that as well. Uh, you know that there are pots available from different organizations that you could tap into locally. Um, yeah, just really fantastic uh, information as well. Hearing about you know the personal effect that you know getting out in nature and getting involved in this local group with. And finding out that so many people in your local area as well were were at the ready, you know, 400 people willing right away to come out to do a bat walk, and then having yeah, 90 amazing. having 90 people come out um, to you know support you and and learn about uh, bats in the local area is just phenomenal. So thank you for that, really inspiring. So we're going to move on to our our Q and A sessions. We've got some questions for both of you. Um, I wonder if we can start with um, a question. Uh, for Pete, please. Um, so, are there any messages that we should be sending our MPs about the Environment Bill and Fisheries Bill 
to show that these issues are ones that their constituents care about and what should we ask them uh, you know, to push for? As a public servant, I, I'm slightly limited in what I can say there, but uh, I mean, by all means, I think um, people should not underestimate how powerful the, um, they are in terms of influencing what their MPs think and, and how they act. So the MP post bags certainly matter. Um, their mailboxes matter. So by all means, email them and say, say what's important to you. The, um, the, the, the big um, issue being debated is, is um, the nature of targets that should be in the environment bill, how challenging should they be? And you might like to say something about that. The, um, the, the way subsidies are paid to farmers. So, so farmers get um, around three and a half billion pounds of, um, of subsidy um, uh, um, across in England alone. Uh, about 10% of that, a little over 10%, is paid for farming in a more environmentally friendly way and delivering public benefits at the moment. The government has said it wants to shift that so that, so that all of that money um, might be spent for delivering public benefits. If that, if that happened, that would be massive and it's hugely important um, that, um, that that sort of change does happen. Uh, and, um, and that might, um, again, be the kind of... Um, um, uh, thing you might write to your MP to encourage. Thank you, lovely. Right, so, Could I also, if, if I may, um, Karen asked a really interesting question. I was watching the Q&A just talking about, you know, can it all be left to governments then? And, and I think um, I really wouldn't want to leave that impression. I think government action is really important, but, but actually the level of um, behavioural change needed by society cannot be underestimated. Uh, and our choices, and as Sean said, our choices really matter. And, uh, and so, the, the, you know, Sean set out his five-point plan, your dietary choices, what you choose to buy, it's our consumption that is driving the changes in this world and the waste associated with our consumption. So, so we are all more powerful than we think. Our real power is in, in our wallets. And um, the way we spend that money is, is, is hugely important. But what I was trying to say is that this is doable. It needs unprecedented levels of change and, and uh, coordination across different sectors. But we know how to, how to fix this. We can afford it. And, and we need to act now. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a really good point. I think it can be quite overwhelming. Um, the scale of the, the climate and biodiversity crises that we're facing. Um, people might feel sort of disabled, like that whatever they do wouldn't have no impact. But if you've got everybody doing something, you have different uh, or, you know, people, individuals joining up with others, neighbors and uh, their communities to go and, and protect and do their bit for biodiversity in particular in this, in this instance. Um, you know, if many do that across the country and across the world, then you can see you know, huge advances in uh, you know the abundance and the diversity of of, of nature. Um, so some questions as well around a few things around funding. Sean, can you say a little bit about how how difficult it is to get funding for transforming a local space in your area into a protected green space project? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, in a word, it's not. Um, we, there's pots of money out there. So, you know, if you can show um, kind of competency in delivering a project, if you can write a good funding application, um, it does take a little bit of time. Most of those funding bids, you know, the Tesco, Bags of Health, the Greg's one, the um, London National Park City Festival, they take a, a day or, or two to, to write them and bring a kind of project plan together. But I think once you've started small, and we started small, we've worked our way up now um, from kind of two grand pot to a 20 grand pot on, on certain projects. Um, there's lots of money out there to be had for competent individuals or organizations to use in the right way. And, you know, we've had funding kind of pots come and say, we've got this money for this year and it's not all taken. Can you do something? And we just don't have the time or the resource to access it. So I think it is out there. We're lucky um, in the borough where I live that Ealing Council is very pro 
kind of biodiversity and environment and, and they're doing their best um, with their climate change strategy now um, to kind of be seen to be doing projects that support that. Um, so they match funded, you know, the 10 grand we crowdfunded ourselves. Um, so I think just look into your local council um, kind of website and they should have um, resources on there for what's available. Um, but then just start fun start Googling um, environmental grants, environmental funding. You'd be surprised that there's a lot out there. It takes a little bit of time. Um, if you're not used to writing a, a funding bid, maybe try and get some help from someone who will kind of um, give you some pointers. Um, but I would say that it's not difficult. There's money there for these initiatives. It's just about demonstrating that you have a good idea and that you can deliver the project. Yeah. You know from experience that yeah definitely there there is stuff out there to to be taken advantage of really um we're running really short on time um i'm just gonna really briefly um ask the question to you probably sean um what are the, any major barriers or challenges that your wildlife group has has found over time um i think it's um getting people involved I think we, you know, if I could run, if I could run Ealing Wildlife Group full time and have a living out of it, um, we could get a lot more done. But unfortunately, that's not the reality. Um, and I think actually getting competent, skilled, and knowledgeable people involved in various ways. You don't have to come down and clear brambles at our allotment nature reserve, but if you got behind um, a local organisation and really helped them in some other ways and offered your services and offered sponsorship and things, we could get a lot more done. So I think it's about people just getting involved and getting active. There's so many positive reasons to do it and it will enhance your, your life. And as I say, every little helps. It's about thinking global, acting local. Um, and I think if we had more people just get involved, that's the main challenge is, is um, trying to get stuff done on limited time, limited resources. Yeah, as it is with everything. So that's, that's yeah. uh, reassuring to know that there's a, a a variety of ways that people could support and also that businesses might look to support their local wildlife groups uh, specifically maybe even paying uh, for someone's time thank yeah. you both we have other questions and we're going to do our best to answer these questions over the next couple of days and post some things on social media and our website to make sure that everybody can, can get there the answers that they're looking for right so um, now it's time thank you for everyone as well for submitting those questions um, if you want to email us, you can email us at info at iie.uk.com after the event um, and we can talk through anything else that you might like to. Right, so now it is time for our IIE Natural Environment Champion Award. So as I mentioned before, this year we're making a decade, we're marking a decade of the IIE Awards. So in addition to our bronze, silver and green accreditation, we are also in awarding IAE member organizations for really going above and beyond in eight special categories. So today's event is uh, really recognizing an organization that has gone above and beyond, um, you know, supporting biodiversity and connecting people with nature under the Natural Environment Champion category. We were looking for action or projects that they've undertaken, for example, trees or wildflower meadows that they've planted, uh, or things that um, improve the natural environment around them and how they measured their impact. Um, the award will also recognize the business for how they've contributed to enhancing or protecting the natural environment, uh, including support for biodiversity, that abundance and diversity and conservation. And the winner of the Natural Environment Champion for 2020 is Manchester University NHS Trust. Uh, we're delighted to share that across seven hospitals, there's so much going on to help boost nature within urban spaces. Uh, MFT have transformed the space um, with low ecological value outside of the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital into a vibrant, and welcoming green space. Bug hotels and planting schemes were designed with pollinators and biodiversity in mind, as well as providing accessible and varied seating areas the people could go out and engage with that natural environment. This has transformed the area into a popular rec recreational recovery and reflection space for patients, their families, and also staff members. The site is also hosting, um, the site also hosts an urban beekeeping project, which is run by staff volunteers, which is really uh, noteworthy. And, and I believe they even sell the honey um, uh, to, to people in the community to raise funds for the project. Within Shaw Hospital and North Manchester General Hospital have some green space that's also dedicated to allotments, making clear links between the natural environment 
food production, and health. So big congratulations goes, goes to Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust. So thank you everybody for attending today, um, this, this very enlightening talk. Um, thank you so much to our guest speakers, Dr. Peter Brotherton and Dr. Sean McCormack for your passion and knowledge. I think it's been incredibly motivating and inspiring for me and I know many others in the chat box that have been enjoying the talk. Um, thank you to our category sponsor, Davies Veterinary Specialist. And thank you also to our other IA Award sponsors for 2020, BGL Group, Cross Keys Homes, Ecotricity, Cool Food, Warthorn Solicitors, Hunt and Coombe Solicitors, and Green Energy Switch. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.